And then there were 16, 16 players, 16 world finalists, 16 people all vying for that chance to be labeled a world champion and carry that with them for the rest of their days. Hello and welcome to Three Crowns. I'm Rich Slayton, joining me as always, my good friend, Andrew Guy, and of course, two-time regional Clash Royale League champion, Joshua A.C. Sharon. This has been your home for all esports news and beyond in the Clash Royale world. And we are getting to the culmination of our year. The most important thing in just a little bit of time, we are heading to Helsinki, Finland for World Finals. Andrew, we've covered so much this year, so much going on in Clash Royale League, and today is maybe the most important show of our season. I feel like I'm bursting at the seams, man. I am so excited. World Finals is finally upon us. That million dollar cash prize is just around the corner. And here on our season finale of Three Crowns, we have a lot to get through. Stage five in the LCQ was an absolute barn burner. 10 more players joined the illustrious six golden ticket holders to make out our 16 world finalists. AC is gonna talk about how that massive emergency I guess nerf on Giant Skeleton and Mirror is going to affect World Finals. Will they both just completely fall off or will one of them show up? And of course, World Finals, World Finals conversation. We're gonna talk about all the factors that are gonna come into play for our competitors. And of course, talking through our first round of the bracket. Whew. But first, Rich, talk to me about stage five and that LCQ. It was, of course, more great Clash Royale action as we decided our final 10 players who got into our World Finals coming up here at the end of September. We'll get into the exact players a bit later, but right now let's look at some of the best moments from our weekend. Kicking things off, I know a match that my buddy AC is really excited about. It's Air Surfer up against Pandora. Winner guarantees themselves a spot at World Finals, currently at that 2-0 record in Stage 5. And you see, just able to get the damage through on spells, Air Surfer gets that lead up to 523 to 763, but the Fireball makes it very, very close. Pandora trying to get the drill on and see if he can beat out the EQ log damage, but the Valk gets there. Air Surfer clutches up in game number one, goes on to win this one in game number three and he'll be appearing in Helsinki for World Finals on to our next big moment sweep against Surgical Goblin sweep running the Giant Skelly Skelly Barrel clone deck a little bit of cheese and check that out as the Giant Skeleton gets through and on to tower but nice move from the Fisherman to save the tower from the Giant Skelly bomb so tower down in a whole lot of trouble Fisherman Gets the job done. Now check out this fireball prediction. Surgical Goblin throws the fireball. Barbs hadn't been played yet. That's why Surge is one of the greats. Although, as you might know, Surgical Goblin did not go through. Sweep ends up winning this matchup and a great performance on to one of our qualifiers here. Ender up against Yuya. This was a brilliant play. The pre-log there takes care of all the business, knocks the AQ out of the range and gets the Hog Rider on tower. That was necessary Hog Rider damage. And you can see as this Royal Giant does get in there and get the shots down, if that Hog didn't get through, this could have been a very different outcome. Instead, it's Ender moving on and he will eventually, of course, qualify for our World Finals. Great pre-log play out of the young man. GG, well played with the dub over Yuya. Onto it was a great play. Faust against KK. Faust, one of Germany's young stars, making a big showing against KK. Check out this play on the left-hand side as he drops the E-Barbs plus Magic Archer. The E-Barbs to protect the Magic Archer and get that value. Look at all the damage on the left-hand side from Faust. Brilliant play by him. He was able to hold off here against KK on this Hog Rider, but of course it's KK who goes on to our final clip of the day. KK up against Trainer Toby. Winner goes on, loser leaves town. And while KK's way ahead playing bait, you love to see him play that deck. Look at the pressure coming in on the right-hand side right now with the double muskies. The delivery comes down, doesn't take the musketeer off the board. Check out the fancy footwork from KK right here on defense. You're gonna see a high cannon that gets the musketeer off the board. A must win play right there for KK. He holds on, survives the onslaught, gets the rocket in, that's GG, that's well played, and that's one of the most popular players in the world. KK 
Moving on to Clash Royale League World Finals. We have 16 World Finalists. That's it. We're done. We're closed. We'll see those guys there in Helsinki, and we'll talk more about those matchups later. But first, let's go to Joshua AC Sharon, our resident pro and expert, to talk a bit about some of the very important changes coming to Clash Royale before we jump into Worlds. Thanks, Rich. That's right. Two cards are getting nerfed, but unfortunately, we really only have time for one. Going really quickly, the mirror, the plus two level into the plus one level before it wasn't used. And I think, unfortunately, that's going to be the case again. I think it's going to go to the graveyard and it's not going to be viable. But let's talk about the one that really is going to get crazy. The giant skeleton 5% health reduction. What's going to happen to it? I think that it's still going to be good. I don't think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be good. What does it still excel at? It still excels at, you know, being a body blocker. I think you can just place it on the map for 30 seconds and it's going to do its job. It's so great for having the support troops just uh, cycling correctly. It, it, it's still going to have a lot of synergy with the champions. Those two pairing together with the bomb and potentially the second bomb with a Mighty Miner, it's going to still be special in that aspect. One of those other decks that has a lot of success right now is the Mighty Miner Bait Mirror decks. And again, with the mirror, it's not going to be viable anymore. So I think there's a lot of potential for the mirror getting nerfed to benefit the Giant Skeleton's nerf. So I think that's one of the things that we really have to keep our eye on. Speaking of eye on, this replay right here just kind of shows the overall strength of the giant skeleton right now. And it's going to be really easy to kind of explain what changes with that. So we have the giant skeleton, the cannon carts, you know, the clone all coming out to play. Will the fisherman yank the giant skeleton in time? And it does. That's why I really like this replay because now, you know, after this nerf, it's not going to yank the giant skeleton away. It would have actually died off on top of the tower. I thought that was such a cool contrast between the before and now the after. The giant skeleton, it is going to change when it comes to the offensive pressure. I think that's the main thing with it. It's still going to be okay on defense, still going to be able to just stay alive on the board. But offensively, you need it to remain with that 15 to 25% health range. And now because of the HP reduction, it's going to be in that, you know, seven to 15% health range. And it just doesn't work. You know, the giant skeleton in front of the RG, while the giant skeleton is on the board, you know, your opponent is going to have to be careful how they're spreading out troops. Can they play the hunter up top? Can they, you know, uh, bomb tower in the middle, Tesla in the middle and be able to defend properly. Now you don't have that giant skeleton which does mean you're not going to be able to get to six elixir for your lightning for your fireball quick enough and i think that's the main thing that not enough people are looking at the fact that it's on the board is just such a huge plus and so any reduction to the health is just so massive and i really think it has the potential to not die off completely i think we're still going to see a little bit of play but i do think it is going to change the game for it now it is not up to me to decide how the giant skeleton gets played at the world finals that's up for the competitors to decide with world finals with all these kind of competitions you have to be the one to take that chance you know be that player that still utilizes the giant skeleton and its glorious bomb so i think uh i think there's nothing else for me to say i think it's up to andrew to actually talk about the world finals Thanks a lot, AC. And while Giant Skeleton and Mirror may not show up at World Finals, we will definitely be there. And with World Finals coming for the first time in person since 2019, there's a lot of factors that come in. So gentlemen, we have to have the conversation about the bracket. We have to have the conversation about building decks, live versus online, your coaches. All of that is a very relevant factor when you talk about World Finals. So I wanna start with you, Rich. Uh, how about this deck building in person that they get a little bit of time, about two minutes between each game, and and also the fact that their coaches are not allowed on stage or backstage. 
yeah, that's going to be interesting. I'm curious how that communication might work between coaches and players, whether coaches will go give them a, a coherent game plan beforehand to follow, and it's up to the player to make live reactions from game to game, or if there's going to be some method for the coach to kind of give them some information of like, hey, throw this in for that, which you had planned instead. That's going to be a really a, a challenge, and I do think that the two biggest changes here are, of course, going from online to live, and for the players, the 10 players who qualified through our in-game tournament system, going to the live deck building. For some of those players, that's old hat. I know Morton is uh, working with one of our with one of our, our best uh, analysis, our analysts and coaches in the game. A lot of those players are, but some of those players have never competed within that methodology before. That's going to be kind of a big impact on this tournament. Yeah, and we saw last year at our World Finals what can happen when you're building decks live and on the fly and the good sides of it and the bad sides of it. AC, live versus online, man. You were a competitor that stood on those big towers. You did it in the States. You did it in Tokyo. You did it in China. What do these players need to do to get ready to be playing live once again? A lot of these guys that are here have built a name over the last couple of years where we haven't been in person. You've done it time and time again. How are they going to succeed? Oh, man, in terms of preparation for it, there's really nothing you can do. Uh, I mean, it, you're just going to be thrown out there and you just have to try to perform. Uh, I, I really, I, I don't know how some of these players are going to fare for that. Uh, I, I've been in a lot of talks recently with a lot of the pros and a lot of the people around the scene. And there's a couple players that they're actually really worried about. And they think that the limelight is going to be too much for them. Yeah, and then also the fact of like not having the coaches on stage, backstage, or having that second device to maybe watch Elixir or track what your opponent's doing. How do you think that factors into being on stage as well? Do you think a lot of players will be kind of missing a crutch that they used to lean on? Or do you think it'll actually help them dial in? We heard maybe Mo talk about it maybe a couple months ago about when he didn't have his coach in his ear, he felt more focused on the game. Do you think this could be a positive or a negative for a lot of these guys? I think it's really going to show who the true best players are. Uh, there's a lot of outside things that will be able to benefit the players when it's online, you have plenty of time, you don't feel the nerves. Uh, when it comes to just being on stage, you don't have Elixir in the background, you don't have you know three people on call telling you, oh, you know, this card is out of cycle, when you were pretty sure it was out of cycle, but you really didn't know, that difference is really going to show who the best players are and who really deserves to be crowned a world champion. All right, we got our bracket here, Rich. It's double elimination over the three-day competition. Our very, very first matchup is Sandbox versus Humble Keef. Uh, Sandbox, definitely more experienced in the CRL stage. Boys, any thoughts on this very first matchup? I, I'm going to go first. I think it's kind of an easy pick. I think Sandbox will probably take round number one against Keith. Yeah, this should be Sandbox, I, and I, I think I'm probably going to, unless Josh is going to surprise us, can I just vote for you yeah. too? Yeah, you can, one, Josh, you can Not vote. to denigrate Keith here. <laughs> All right, an easy 3-0 there. Okay, the next one I think is a lot more interesting when you talk about Sweep versus Arden Toa. Sweep did some crazy stuff throughout our LCQ. Arden Toa was really fancy earlier on in the year. Guys, which way is this going to go? AC, you love Sweep. Are you betting on him again or no? <sighs> I, I really have been impressed by what Sweep has accomplished in the past couple stages, but I, I'm I'm a true believer in Arden. I, I think he's just way too talented, and I see him moving on. Rich? This is one of the hardest ones to pick because you don't know what Sweep shows up. When yeah. the, we're having a relaxed version of Sweep, which is why he's been successful here, but sometimes we get this like devil may care, throw it to the wind, I like almost self-sabotaging Sweep in certain occasions. If the if the one we saw during this last stage of competition shows up, Arden could be in some trouble. But I just don't know if he shows up. So yeah, I think Arden's the favorite here, but not by a huge margin you would expect. All right, well then I'm gonna play devil's advocate. Even though I actually do believe Arden probably takes this round, I'm gonna go for sweep because of that live, live stage experience and the age difference. It's only a couple mm -hmm. years, but sweep's been in the studio, he's been on the stages, and he's had just a little bit more time to mature, if you will. Whereas I wonder if Arden gets there and those bright lights get to him. We'll see, Arden has been incredibly impressive. All right, guys, our next match 
matchup, an interesting one here, two golden ticket recipients. However, they were both given that ticket by Mohamed Light, who placed first numerous times throughout the year. We have Gens Aslan out of Turkey, and of course, Lucas X Gamer from Brazil. Boys, who is the favorite here on paper? I'm sure it's Lucas, but Aslan has been playing really great throughout all of 2021 and 2022. Rich, favorite or it, up and It's, it's got to be Lucas for two reasons. One, just you know, talk about on paper accomplishment wise, skill wise. Lucas, I think even I think even Aslan might say that Lucas is the better player. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but Lucas is definitely one of those top five players in the world. But then you add in the second factor here that Lucas has already gotten that first live event out of the way when he went to DreamHack yep. in Spain and played through some live event experience there with a pretty loud crowd and big time names. So I think you put those two things together. Lucas is already a phenomenal player. He's kind of gotten those first jitters out of the way. I think it's a pretty clear pick for Lucas here. That's two for Lucas. AC, you going to make it an even three, or are you going with Gens Aslan? Yeah, uh, I have to go with Lucas. I really don't even have that many things to say about him. He's just talented. He, he's proven himself. He's willing to work, and I think he's ready for it. I, I know he hates losing, so the fact that he finished second to get his golden ticket probably hurts him a lot, and you know maybe he doesn't want to finish second again. Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to have to obviously agree, like I just said, but one of the last things I want to add in is that Lucas has shown a lot of maturity, I think, in 2022 of kind of just growing up a little bit and dealing with all these second places or even lower finishes. It, it takes a toll on you. So like you said, I think he also does have a little bit of a chip on his shoulder for that second place golden ticket. Uh, I'm going with him as well. The next one is an interesting one because Sam Lubasoto was the very first player to qualify. He was the very first player to get that golden ticket, whereas Cal Dominic or Doom is someone who maybe you haven't heard of as much. He's a Lava player, I believe, AC. What do you think about this matchup between your former teammate and a guy who is relatively unknown in comparison? Yeah, I mean, obviously Samuel Basoto, uh, tons of experience, veteran in the game, uh, one of the best players just in the history of Clash Royale. Uh, but there's been a lot of talk saying that, you know, maybe he hasn't been performing as well in the past couple months. On the other side, Doom has really impressed me recently. He went three and one in stage four, three and one in stage five. And again, going back to the, the little chat I have with a couple of the pros, I mentioned that I thought that that Samuel Basoto was kind of my favorite in that matchup. And then Doom's response, it was three words. He said, I said, I might flip how I feel about that. He said, you will flip. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Rich, what are your thoughts on this matchup, man? That confidence is uh, hard to ignore. It's hard. It's really hard. And Doom's a guy who's been grinding hard for a long time, who's been putting not just a hard grind, but like an emotional effort into his work for a while. So uh, that does bear well for Doom. And yeah, the big question of how much is Sam grinding these days? Yeah. That's a that's a big question that I know the all players are have pros are having trouble finding good practice partners right now too, as some of the other players begin to peel off and finally take a break from their from their work. The big X factor here is one of the biggest X factors in all of it, that Sam has a lot of live event experience. Doom does not have that same live event experience. If Sam's nerves are under control and Doom's aren't when we get out there, that could be a problem. If it isn't, Doom might be the unexpected favorite. Here. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of lean the same way as you guys. I'm not going to bet against Samuel Basoto, but I will not be surprised if Doom takes this set. I feel like I haven't seen Sam since like February or whatever. You know, I've seen so little of him yeah. over the last half year. It would not surprise me at all if Doom was able to take this very first best of three in our first day. Next up, Morton, one of the tr most tried, true vets, the German goat, whatever you want to call him going up against Ender G. And this is a really, really interesting one because no one knows, you know, if Morton has what it takes to get that first place spot, even though he's shown he's one of the best to ever do it. Uh, I'm going to open the field up to this one. Either one of you guys, which way do you go on this? Because Ender was really impressive in stages five, in stage five, excuse me. SK Morton, I, you're, you're, you're gonna, it's a hard to find a place for me to vote against Morton. Um, there's a very short list of people who make me question that decision. And the big factor here that is going to be the, is everything. Morton, the, the live event experience at the highest level. Yeah. Playing live on stage in world finals. Nothing's going to be as nervous for him as those final seconds playing against Surgical Goblin in semifinals, right? So that's such a huge leg up over Ender. I do think that Morton's also a better player than Ender. And not to say that Ender's not a world-class player. He's proven that by getting here. 
But I think that if you look at every single box of how you measure this one, you got to check that box for Morton. AC, no surgical goblin to pierce through and give him that one HP loss. Do you think Morton is the big time favorite in this matchup? Well, here's the thing. Uh, this is the difference between live and online. Morton is six foot 18. That, that intimidation factor, <laughs> it's, it's just too much. I, I expect round one and round two, he's just going to fly by that. Round three is when people are actually going to be used to that. Uh, yeah, a fun little tidbit for you guys at home. I think it was in season one, Morton and Sam were the only two that were allowed to have chairs up on top of the towers because they were so tall. Uh, yes, I agree. He's a very intimidating man. And speaking of intimidation, Moogie v versus Vitor, our defending world champion up against one of the best to ever do it. I think we would have been a bit surprised if Vitor did not show up at our world finals, but it would have definitely been more surprising had Moogie not returned to defend his championship. Uh, I'm going to do it again. Uh, it's easy because I'm fielding the questions, but I saw so much greatness out of Mugi this year. When I saw him dialed in, he was unbeatable. AC, we got one of the best sets we'd ever seen between, I believe, Mugi and Wallace, yep. where it looked like Wallace had played the best Clash Royale we'd ever seen, and he still lost to Mugi, which means he is just so on top of his interactions, his micro, his macro, and the confidence. I'm going Mugi in this matchup, even though Vitor is a very exceptional player. Yeah, I think with Mugi, it's going to be some of the which Mugi is going to show up, but it's it's either the Mugi that isn't totally the best in the world and he's going to finish top four, or it's the Mugi that's going to finish number one. I, I, I don't see him losing in round number one. Rich, you on the Mugi train? Yeah, and you know, and people, I know that I've often been uh, uh, resistant to the powers of Moogie in the past, so to speak. <laughs> um, and it's just more about that who's the best in the world right now conversation between him and a guy we'll talk about later. Uh, but I think besides the fact that Moogie is one of the three best players on the planet, it's that I have a lot of concerns about Vitor playing live. Mm. We've seen how stress gets to him playing online. Right, So I think he's done a lot to overcome that, and we've seen the results of that with him qualifying here. But you still can see when he wears that stress on his face. I'm concerned about how he, sh how he fares when he's got hundreds of people cheering in the room looking at him. Has he done enough work to get over that, or is that going to get to him in this situation? Yeah, and you know the guy that you're mentioning that we're going to talk about later is another guy that has a question mark, I think, with live experience as well, at least in this form. Next up, we have KK versus Mohamed Light, the consensus greatest player in the world, the number one, the favorite to win world finals. But when you talk about his live stage experience compared to some others, like even KK or you know someone like Morton, can Mohamed Light still be the GOAT? And I, it just feels impossible to bet against him, but KK is so dang good, and he does actually have that live stage experience. Guys, is there any way that KK plays upset here? Uh, I mean, is there a way? Maybe. I think that, you know, Mo with uh, working with Julesy last year, who's with, Moha, with with Morton this year, and now with Jeebus, I think he has a really great game plan coming in. And one thing we've seen from Mohamed Light, even though it's been online only, it's been the ability to recover and overcome adversity, yeah. to battle through the winner's bracket, to battle back through the lower bracket. Mo's very good at recovery. So, I, I, you know, I think he'll beat KK. He should be the favorite in that matchup. Um, and even if he does lose to KK, he's the kind of guy who will be, be the, one of the best players to pick to work his way through a lower bracket back into a championship. AC, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, too many tournament wins this year. Uh, it, I, the gameplay that we've seen from him, he has me stuttering. Like, he is just so solid. He's so good. <laughs> I, I, He's so good. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Uh, last matchup of our uh, first round of eight, Air Surfer versus Pandora. This is a really exciting one. Uh, AC, Air Surfer, longtime friend. Is he able to win this first round matchup? Absolutely. I loved his confidence this year. He's been so solid overall. His decks have kind of been, uh, you know, he, he's not just using one or two or three different decks. He's kind of willing to use other decks. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the best Air Surfer that I've seen probably ever. Rich, is it world champion quality air surfer though? Or will Pandora be able to take him down in round one? I don't know if it's world champion quality air surfer, but I do know that it's a better air surfer as Josh just said. He just beat Pandora in stage five to qualify here. Air surfer's on a tear. And I think that if there's anybody coming into world finals with a chip on his shoulder, whose name isn't Morton, it's air surfer. He has a lot to prove here. Uh, he knows he's one of the best to ever play the game. And this might be that big last opportunity to really put a stamp on the game overall. I, I, I pick air surfer here in round number one. Yeah, I think you guys make phenomenal points about him being dialed in the best air 
air surfer that we've seen, the live stage experience and having the chip on his shoulder. I love someone that's got a chip on their shoulder. I'm going air surfer as well. Those are our round one picks, guys. Let us know down below in the comments who you guys think is going to win the round one matchups. Did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? And of course, you can let us know your favorites and dark horses because that's what we're going to get into right now. Uh, I'm going to start with mine. My favorite, I think it's pretty easy, pretty obvious, and it might be easy for you guys to hop on the train as well. We'll see. Uh, Rich, Josh, are we all going Mohammed Light here? AEC, I'm going to start with you. Uh, absolutely. There, there's no one better. <laughs> okay, that's two for uh, two for three. Rich, are you going to make it an even three for three? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. Even though Mohammed Light is logically on paper the favorite, I'm going to I'm going to kind of break some tradition here. My favorite pick is also my dark horse pick, and that's Morton. He's both of those things at one time. Morton's not supposed to win this competition, right? He's supposed to win. If you look at all the numbers, he's supposed to get second, honestly. And he's he's if everyone if you ask anybody, they probably would say Morton's going to make top five, but not win this one. And I think that that's just the type of opportunity that he needs. This is the most interesting field ever. You have two of the greatest players to ever actually touch the game in terms of micro and macro in Mugi and Mohamed Light. But Morton comes in with so many world finals, playing it live on stage, playing in front of a roaring crowd in the biggest moment ever. Uh, he is, I think that there's a huge chance he captures that and takes that all the way through. He is also working with Julesy. He's the only guy that Julesy, who took Mo all the way through last year, he's the only guy working with Julesy this year. Whereas I know that some of the other analysts are working with multiple players at once. He has the full focus of one of the all-time best analyst coaches in the game. And this feels like it's Morton's, mo Morton's moment. But also, we have that number two curse. So he is both my, my favorite and my dark horse pick. Yeah, and he was able to do it live earlier this year right so that is a really really great pick i love that he's your favorite and your dark horse uh my dark horse is obviously not going to be muhammad light I'm going to go with, as weird as it is, because I just bet against him, I'm going with Arden Toas. I love the way that he plays. Yes, I played Devil's Advocate when we're talking about that bracket breakdown, but just because you lose once doesn't mean you're out of the competition. And Arden Toas is a guy that I think has some of the best exciting gameplay that you see. It's like what people always talk about, those young, hot rookies doing these crazy things that, you know, the old guys have never seen before. I don't think it's quite that extreme, but I do think Arden has shown that he's willing to make predictive plays early on in matchups that really pay off. And then if those don't work, he's able to kind of calm himself down, reset, pick good deck choices to put himself in good positions. He never finds himself in 100 zeros. At worst, it's 60, 40, 70, 30, which is kind of what you can ask for in a bad matchup in dual mode. I'm going Arden Toas all the way. Yeah, I guess that leaves me. My dark horse, it is going to be Doom. Uh, you know, a, a kind of nice little tidbit is, I think it was like two, three years ago, uh, he actually helped me out. We were, he was doing like a little coaching thing. He was teaching me Lava. He was teaching me a lot of the matchups. And I think we worked together for about two, two and a half hours. Not only did I win maybe at most three games during that two, two and a half hour session, but the entire time he was explaining matchups and he was kind of talking down to me while he was doing it. And it, it, it was mostly, it was mostly a language barrier. <laughs> But it, at the same time, I, I didn't feel resentment towards it. I was like, oh, this is so cool. He's so much smarter. He's so much better than me. He, he knows what he's doing. And I didn't get that feeling, especially back then, that a lot of the players were like that. You know, for me, it was kind of, oh, everybody's a pro. Everybody's kind of at a similar level. And he really brought a level of insight that I didn't really feel from a lot of other players. I love it. The brash confidence. So two for Mo. Rich is going Morton in both directions. You got AC's Dark Horse is Doom, and I'm going with Arden Toas. Those are our picks for Dark Horse and Favorites, and those are our picks for the matches in round number one. Guys, let us know down below once again if we hit it, if we didn't, and your favorites. Of course, Rich, all this conversation is leading to Clash Fest, our three-day Clash Royale million-dollar event world finals. If you don't know what it is, guys, Rich, let them know. Clash Fest, exactly what Andrew just said. It is the opportunity to watch the best Clash Royale players in the world compete for that championship from the Helsinki Events and Convention Center live September 23rd through 25th in a joint event with Clash of Clans as well. So you can get the Clash of Clans World Finals and of course the Clash Royale League World Finals, both of those coming together in one place. That's September 23rd through 25th for Clash Fest. Yeah, guys, and you can get tickets esports.clashroyale.com. Follow along with everything that we are doing 
at Esports Royale EN on Twitter. Of course, subscribe to the channel here. This is our season one finale. We loved having you guys with us, but make sure you're subscribed so you know when we come back, you'll get those notifications turned on so that every time we go live, you guys will know and you don't want to miss a second of World Finals. And they're going to be happening right here in this exact same place. And of course, in case you're not able to get to a computer, in case you're not able to do all those things that we just asked you, just check out your tournament hub in game. All the details you need are right there as well. That's it for our first season of Three Crowns. We're so excited for what's coming up next. On behalf of everybody here at Clash Royale League and your guy, Joshua A. C. Sharon, I'm Rich Slayton. We'll see you next time live from World Finals in Helsinki.